Hello and welcome to BU Talks. This is a podcast series where we build our souls as well as our CVs. I'm your host, Ethan Pohl, and today I'm interviewing Dr. Stephen Cole of the Sociology Department here at Bishops University. We'd like to thank the Experiential Learning Internship Grant Fund, the Bishop's Bookstore, and the Advancement Office for making this podcast series possible. Before we start, we'd first like to acknowledge uh, the territory on which we hold BU Talks is the traditional and unceded territory of the Abenaki First Nations and the Abenaki Confederation. In performing land acknowledgement, we make what was invisible visible and invite the land, the First Nations people, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission into our conversation today. So, Dr. Cole, if you could just first introduce yourself, let us know what it is you do here at Bishops, and what makes you special as a professor? (laughs) Oh boy, small one. Um, First, thanks for inviting me to do this. This this is going to be fun. Um, I'm Stephen Cole. I'm, as you know, a professor in the Department of Sociology, and I am primarily a social theorist, and I have been at Bishops now, what year is it? 2018 now? 18. It'll be eight years this September since I, I joined the department full-time. And um, yeah, I teach Intro to Soch, theory courses, an honors theory course, a course called Social Problems, and really I'm interested in anything that has to do with groups and how that group dynamic affects us as individuals in our lives. So one of the most pressing, I've, I've had a couple of courses with you, but I've never actually gotten the answer to this question. <laughs> Who is your favorite social theorist? And sort of a related question, but the answer might be different. Who is the social theorist that you agree with most? That's a tough one. Um, it would really on any given day, whoever I'm reading can be my favorite. <laughs> but when it goes right back to how I got into this and what got me interested in, in sociological theory, it's, it's got to be Marx. Uh, this was the first time I really, in terms of academia, read something that just grabbed me and I wanted to read more and more and more. And in high school, I was not the type of student who was academically interested, I guess the way to say it. Right? <laughs> uh, and this reading this just pulled me in and I wanted to, to explore that. And I still go back to it. I still teach Marx, um, as you know. Um, I still gets me excited in lecture. Students can see it. He was really foundational in, in, in bringing me into the discipline, and he's still where I go back to as kind of my home base. In terms of agreement, I'm still really informed and in, in an agreement with uh, the work of Pierre Bourdieu. And he ha- also has a, a Marx tie coming yeah. back through, through his development. But what I liked about Bourdieu is that he gives us a really interesting way to understand the relationship between what we call, I won't go into lecture mode, (laughs) but what we call structured agency in sociology. Are we determined by things outside of us in the social world or are our actions based upon our own personal choices and desires and wants? And Bourdieu's theory really does a nice way of bringing those things together and showing how even our individual choices are informed by structure and how the structure is in itself the outcome of individual choices. So he's who I like to work with. He's the center of a, a new research project I'm, I'm, I've pitched on education. Um, and so he's where I consider myself in terms of home base now is where I really see myself as a theorist. Yeah, so let's segue into that research project. Now, according to Dr. Adele, who has given us sort of the, the background on this, not, not a ton because we want to hear about it from you, mm-hmm. but you've brought together yourself, a sociologist, uh, a historian, if I'm correct, mm-hmm. and a psychologist yes. to study education. Yes. Now, how does, that, how does that work? How do you bring together those people from vastly different disciplines Mm -hmm. and work on a single common goal and research project? Well, I'll tell you if it works or not at the end of this. (laughs) (laughs) Um, There's always overlap in between disciplines. It's one of the great things you get to do as an undergrad um, is you get to take all this stuff in these different disciplines and pull it together. As you start to specialize as you go up in your degrees, to your master's, to your PhD, to your research, there's a tendency to get narrowed, and I wanted to kind of spread out a bit. It's a new 
area of work for me. I, I don't have a background in the sociology of education, but they bring to it an understanding of the historical development of education in Quebec, uh, an understanding of language acquisition, which will be very important because we're looking at uh, the nature of English education in Quebec, why people choose it, the ramifications of that choice. And so they bring it to a, a, an area of expertise that I just don't have. And also, when you start to engage in dialogue, you become open to new things and having to explain, well, they're looking at me like, why are you interested in this? <laughs> and so I end up talking about Bourdieu and this nature of choice and the relationship of choices in one's position in society. And so they're interested in that. And learning from other colleagues as you're researching is, is a huge part of, of what we do. It's the exciting part of what we do. I, I don't want to just do the same thing I've been doing for you know 40 years and then retire. So I'm excited about the project in working with colleagues in, in a multidisciplinary way. When I look back at my education in high school and middle school, and less so in university, but uh, I find that one of the major things that I find was missing was an, an interdisciplinary aspect. You know, you go to <coughs> math class for an hour, you go to science class for an hour, and there's no connection between the teachers, there's no shared concepts or... I mean, maybe math and science have some shared concepts, but you're not using the concepts you learn in English class in your math courses. Mm -hmm. So, and it's really good to see that sort of interdisciplinary aspect of learning come together at the you know highest level of you know, education and, and research. Yeah, it's um, multidisciplinary stuff was has been like the kind of hot area where everyone's been encouraged to do it. Um, and it just is, it does bring that wider perspective to everything you can do. So in your courses, you often deal with these complex theories that were written a very long time ago, especially for Marx back in the 1800s, mm -hmm. Durkheim as well. Uh, how do you make that accessible to a, you know, uh, to today's students? Is, do you have to adapt these theories or is there's something unique about these theories that makes them stand the test of time and makes them accessible to everyone. It's tough um, because the material's hard. And that first step into it is always a bit of a struggle. But one of the things I try to show is that, okay, let's look at a guy who wrote almost, basically 200 years ago in Germany at the very beginning of capitalism, mod, like full on capitalism. And let's see if he can actually say anything that makes sense to us about how we're living here in 2018. And as soon as you can do it, as you can make that connection, that's when you can start to see the lights go on. Uh, so it is difficult, but most students can relate with something. Like if we're going to talk about Marx, um, most of us have had a crappy job. Right? <laughs> most of us don't want a crappy job. And so there's your avenue in. Right? And then there's an interesting, you can start to show, well, okay, so why is it that so many of us, so much of our life is dictated by getting a job, getting a job? What does that lead us to question? What does it lead us to think about? Um, what should, even a broader question could be, what is the place of work in one's life, right? Um, so what I try to show in my classes is that, look, we're not just doing this because it's academically interesting. In a couple of years, you're going to graduate and you're going to look for a job and you're going to be doing all these things we, we've we talked about. Um, okay, you're free to choose who you work for. You know, Mark says you're, you're, free to, you're free to choose your exploiter. <laughs> Who's going to exploit me every day? Who's going to rip me off every single hour? Now, for those of you who haven't done Marx, he basically says that profit is made by ripping off people who work for you. You give them less than they give you in return. That's the heart of profit. And when students hear that, they're like, what? Because <laughs> nobody wants to be screwed over. Oh, yeah. No one wants to be ripped off. And once I can get that, start to work through that, and then it becomes so much easier because students want to, well, well tell me more because I don't want to be taken advantage of or I want to understand what's going on here. Um, and that's the great pleasure for it for me is that if I can get someone interested, then my job becomes more and more easy because they just want to start taking over and, and exploring and, and developing themselves. Did you ever have a professor, or a teacher, or a mentor who influenced you and informs the way that you teach in the classroom? Yeah, I had a lot. I was, 
you know, very lucky, um, especially as an undergrad, I had some great teachers. Uh, Wendy O'Brien, Deb Paranis, um, I know these names won't mean anything to a lot of people, but I have to give them props. Uh, Barbara Marshall, uh, Friedrich Zixel. These are all people who were f fundamental in establishing me as a, as a theorist, um, and getting me interested in academia in general. First person in my, first generation in my family, so me and my siblings uh, are the first generation to go to university. I'm the only one who has a PhD. I never thought in a million years I'd end up being a professor. Um, some of my old friends, like, we still laugh about that. Like, how did that happen? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. <laughs> um, but these teachers had a way of pulling me in. And they would ask questions that eventually I would get interested in. I'd, I, I just had to find out if there was an answer. And that was the great gift they gave me, was that the way they presented material, um, they would do it in this very logical unfolding that would pull me in and then I just had to go. I had to keep going deeper, deeper, deeper. So I've tried to take that from all of them in, into my own lectures. And this is the way I like to present things. Let's start with a problem. Let's think about some of the, the questions that arise from a basic issue and then start to develop them in a way that we build and build and build and build until we, we come up with some solution. I don't know if, I don't think all students like it, but I know that some students really get captivated um, by that process, by my approach. I don't mean that in a look at me in a great way. I've had some very students say some very nice things to me, but I in turn have to say, well, I got that all from these great props that I saw and it was influenced by uh, when I was coming up. A lot of times it just takes getting the material presented in the right way um, to really just turn on the lights for students. Yeah. My approach is highly influenced by the, the courses I liked the most. I didn't like survey courses for theory. I never liked them as a student. I thought I'd end up learning like a little bit about, a lot about nothing. Can you I just define survey courses? Survey course for me is you're gonna do a whole bunch of little things about a wide area, right? Or many different topics. And that's the way I kind of approach Social 101 or social problems, which I teach. We'll look at a different issue each week. I try to tie them together some way. But in theory, in theory courses, I found if, if you're just going to read a theorist for one or two weeks tops, you can't really get into their work in any way that, A, anything sticks with you. You've forgotten it two weeks after the course ends. Um, and B, I found those survey courses, you, you couldn't see how people fit together. You were just, here's a drastic set of issues, here's something else, like how those would ever meet, or you would work through that problem, who knows. So I prefer to take, and this is the courses I like to gain as an undergrad, take four, five, six weeks and work through a theorist very methodically. You know, this is work through the logic of it. You, maybe you don't get exposed to quite as much in one of my courses, but you're really going to know something in detail. Um, and I will say, again, don't mean to toot my own horn here. This is kind of an awkward <laughs> position. But students who have gone on to grad school, have emailed me or come back to campus um, and they've told me like I'm kicking ass in master's <laughs> level theory they're like I've had people flat out tell me I hated you when I was here well I hated you personally but your courses were so hard and you were unrelenting and now I'm like yeah <laughs> I was like well thank you I guess <laughs> I know that sometimes I push students and my standards are high but if you can start to work into it, it's so rewarding on the other end. Um, you develop something in a way you just don't get if you kind of read secondary sources about what 18 different people said. Yeah, and I, from personal experience, last semester I took a Source 490 Contemporary Theory with you, and we really only covered, you know, Baudrillard and Foucault. Mm -hmm. But then there was all of the theorists that, you know, fit into them, like uh, there's Saussure who talked about, you know, language and the relationship between uh, society and language and how concepts and words are interrelated and, and interdependent. But since Baudrillard's work uses so much of Saussure, you have to understand Saussure to understand Baudrillard mm -hmm. uh, and to understand, you know, Baudrillard's critique of, of what Marx says about 
consumption and society and the economy. And I thought that was a very important thing to do to, to go through, to really go in depth about Saussure and what he's saying, because Saussure is, he's, if you, he's not someone that you spend an hour on and you understand. <laughs> uh, his concepts are very in depth. There's a lot of, you know, social constructionism in, in his work. And if you don't understand that, then you just sort of do the old in one ear and out your mouth when you're writing on the test, mm-hmm. you're going to forget Baudrillard and the, the uh, theoretical underpinnings of his work in about three weeks. Mm-hmm. So even though we didn't go into you know, Bourdieu and all those other social theorists, I feel like in that class we had a very, very solid and well thought out um, understanding of both Baudrillard and Foucault. Mm-hmm. So sort of a thank you. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I, 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 I personally very much enjoyed that course. Oh, well, um, thank you. I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. Um, theory lectures to write in the way I attempt to convey, it's an incredible amount of work to try to pull it together in that way. Um, I mean, it's three hours a week that you have to present something that's difficult, you try to make it interesting, and then you try to think, how's it gonna set up the next week? And then you do that again, how am I gonna set up the next week? Well, three hours a week, back to back to back to back to back, I mean, it's, it's tough. Um, so I, I can't do everything. I will eventually ch- develop some more courses. I actually had students say, why don't you teach more? I was like, well, geez. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm teaching five, you know, four of which are compulsory. Um, I do need to do something else but teach. But I am developing a course in uh, consumerism and consumption. I'd like to do that. Uh, I'll probably get to do some Bourdieu in that. So if anyone out there is listening and is interested, hang on. <laughs> Maybe I'll be able to do something. Um, but for now, the 490 course we just did was new to me. I had a blast doing it. Um, I learned a lot literally isn't just rethinking through that theory. That's one of the things students I don't think understand is that as soon as I start teaching something or any prof starts teaching something, you end up learning it much, much better yourself. And so some of the questions I was getting back on, we were talking about Saucer and it's like, man, okay, how am I going to explain this? And as I was trying to explain, it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, now I see something completely new in it. Uh, this is what I love about the job. It's, it's even if I teach, you know, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim until I retire, every time I do it, I see something new in it. Um, and I, my Marx reader, I did this because the man who taught me, um, Marx, the, the prophet taught me, he said, keep your reader and you'll watch decades of notes start to emerge and you'll be amazed at how different this is. And so literally in the, in the, the reader I use in class, it's the same reader I used as an undergrad. And so I can see notes that I, and comments I made from 20 years ago. And some of them I am like, oh boy, <laughs> I, hope, I hope no one reads that. And other ones I'm like, damn, that's not bad. Like, like that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so, I mean, I, I think I got the best job in the world. I, I get to develop every day. I get to rethink things. Um, I still, I, I mean, do I love marking? No. <laughs> I don't know a single prof who likes marking. Um, but do I love working with ideas? Do I love working with good students and, and hearing their questions? Absolutely. Like, this is, you know, thankfully, you know, this was the outcome of not being a musician. I think the outcome of trying to be a musician would have been this good. <laughs> um, but I, I'm very, in a way, lucky that uh, one of the things I try to tell people in my class is like, just find something you love to do um, because you're going to work for, what, 40 years? And find, find something that you like to do. Um, be an interesting person. Find a, a job that you know, produces you in new ways every year so that you're not the exact same person you were 10 years ago. Um, my goal in life was always to you know, do something I enjoyed 
and figure out a way to get paid for it. Um, and I did. So, you know, cheers to me. <laughs> so that sort of brings us into, you know, the big question that we're trying to ask with this podcast series, which is how do the professors at BU help us to build our souls as well as our CVs? So how do you do that in your courses? How do you get students to not only focus on, you know, what am I going to write down on my resume, but also how am I going to go out into the world as, you know, someone with a soul? Yeah. It's one of the great things about uh, doing Max Weber is when he talks about rationality and, and instrumental action, which, again, I won't go into lecture mode. But Weber says one of the, the key characteristics of modern life is that everything we end up doing is just this rational calculation, means end thinking. So we go to university just to get a job. We get a job just to buy stuff. You know, this long process of calculations. One of the things I want to try to do with students, it's not just about, you know, isn't education great? It's about, this is, we get one chance at this. <laughs> Literally, right? Look, there's, you get one life. So, what do you want to do with it? Do you want to just do things that you need to do to get, you know, A gets B, B gets C? Or do you want to do something interesting? And if I think if I can get that, like, let's just do something interesting. Um, that is a great accomplishment for me if, if any of my students have taken that from my courses. Like, you know what? I don't want just a job. I want to do something I enjoy. Um, I, I, I want to create. I want to be knowledgeable. Interestingly, on the flip side, I know a lot of people may listen to this like, well, that's great, but I, the reality is I need a job. Those are all the skills that jobs are going to need in the next 50 years. Right? Um, we need people who can think. We need people who can refine their judgment. We need people who have expertise. Um, you know, technical skills are fine, but machinery is taking over more and more of that stuff. Um, one of the things I've been thinking about is like, how to explain this? Well, if, if any, if you, I don't know if you watch hockey at all. Oh, yes. But, do. right, I say, well, technology, technology, it's all technology. It's like, well, does video replay really help the game of hockey? And 99% of the time, does it actually clarify anything? No, no it, it always comes down to human expertise and judgment, the very type of skills that we try to develop on campus here and in, in, in everyone's courses, right? Um, you look at you know the stats versus the eye test, right? This big dilemma in high school, do we, or high school in uh, hockey, do we build a team based on statistical information, or do we watch people play and make? Well, to me, that's a perfect understanding of well, the technical skill of statistics, which we learn in statistic in sociology, and one needs to know. But that skill is useless unless you know how to apply the data that comes out of it, how to work with it, how to, that's what expertise is about, right? That's about more, again, about judgment, about being able to refine information and craft it into something. Huge, huge questions come out of this. Um, for me, we talk about technology, I need a job, I need a job. You know, does university fit into a new economy? Yes, like we know that cars are gonna be self-driven. And I'm ripping someone off here. I can't remember how to credit this, but I'll, I'll bring it up. The car, if it's self-driving, at some point has to be programmed to make a decision. If there's a choice between plowing someone who's walking on the sideway and saving the driver or sacrificing the driver's life to save the person on the sidewalk, who's going to program that decision? Who do you want in that boardroom or that, that workshop making that decision? Someone who has great technical skills but has never been exposed to that type of theoretical problem or philosophical problem of all the guys on the ethics, morality, problem solving. Right? Do you want someone who just can program or do you want someone who has thought through and participated in some of the most fundamental discussions of humanity's ever had? Right? right back to the ancient Greeks to what you and I were talking about five minutes ago. Those are the types of people who are going to really excel and thrive in a new economy. Um, so if people are listening and they say, well, it's all easy to say when you're a prof to be like, yeah, develop, have this great job. No, no, that's literally what's needed, right? All those skills that are developed in that process of learning, of loving, loving to learn, to create new solutions, those are exactly what's going to get you a job. 
uh, and, and take you places. So how much did bishops, t- did bishops pay you to uh, give us that whole <laughs> spiel right there? <laughs> Not enough, no. Um, I'm sorry, I, I just felt that it you know, illustrated the, uh, the argument that you know, bishops and the, the Maple League makes for a, a liberal arts education. Mm-hmm. And you know, I totally buy into it, you know, here I am. Uh, about how important it is to not just have those technical skills, but also have you know an understanding of uh, you know critical thinking and looking and problem solving and understanding these things that you don't learn if you just I mean, not to disparage uh, you know trade degrees or anything no, like that. But you, no. you just you just don't find that level of involvement in important skills when you go and get a degree which is designed to get you job a in this economy right now in 2018 well i mean i should say right because i don't want to like you just astutely point it out it's not to disparage trades people or people who are programmers so if you're listening I wasn't trying to put you down. <laughs> if you genuinely like working with your hands or really love programming, that's awesome. You've found that, that love in that thing that I'm ch- trying to exactly. convey, right? The, uh, the idea that I'm trying to get across is that for those of you who think you can't pursue what you love because it's not a trade or because it's not marketable, right? Um, that's, that's the problem. You can do it. Um, don't brush that aside as being... You know, that's not the real world. It won't get me anywhere. It will. I grew up in a household, as I said, I'm, I'm the, me and my siblings are the first to go to university. I grew up in a working class or lower middle class um, household where the question literally was like, well, what are you going to do with that? So when I was coming up, the question, yeah, I'm going to go take a jazz program at Toronto, Mom and Dad. <laughs> that was a bit of a tough sell. But the I, even when I started to go to university, that was like, what are you going to do with that? And it's a common line of thinking that so many people, you know, even if they're not conscious of it, it's always in the back of their head. The idea is, well, what can't you do with that? Uh, Cheryl Goslin, who's a, a member in the department, um, she came up with a great line. She said, we don't prepare you for a job, we prepare you for all of them. Why limit yourself to one particular job? So there may be a bit of, you know, when you're, when you're done, you have to find a job, of course. Um, but you've got all the tools to take that where you want. And it's amazing. Um, again, it's easy sitting here, I've got my job. I think of someone who's coming out of undergrad. And from my perspective, it's like, wow, you could do anything. What an amazing time of your life. Like, look, you can do that, 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 that. You can live in Canada. You can live in Australia. You can live anywhere in between. Wow. Now, I, I understand when you're most undergrads are in their early 20s, all of that opportunity that I'm seeing is like terrifying. <laughs> like, what the hell am I going to do? Which one am I going to pick? You know, um, it works out. For the vast majority of, of, of undergrads, it works out, and the payoff is there. Um, give it some time, enjoy it, find a way to develop right what you want to do because there's always an opportunity there um, to do that and find out what you love and explore it. So what we heard from Dr. Adele is that you are a major feminist mm-hmm. and. How does your you know role as a father? You've got what, two kids. Yes, two young boys. Yeah. How does how does your role as a father and how do you you know reconcile the feminist theory that you have with you know contemporary fatherhood and also how do you bring that into the classroom and and try to teach that to students? Yeah, I mean. Again, let me start off, as, it, as I've said, you know, working class background, my family, lower middle class at best, um, not an educated family. So, and again, given my age, feminism is a, certainly not widely accepted everywhere, but compared to 20 years ago, it's made some headway. So I grew up literally being told and literally thinking that what were feminists, and I, I don't mean to be crude or part of my terminology, but literally we thought 
my friends, people my age, guys, we thought feminists were lesbians who hated men. That's literally what we thought. That, and then within a few years, suddenly I realized, oh my God, I'm a feminist. Is that possible? Like that was, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a guy. Can I be a, well, of course you can be. Yeah. I mean, at its heart, what do you mean by being a feminist? That women are men's equal, right? Um, that things that are deemed are considered feminine are not secondary, second-rate versions of masculine things. On a very base, basic level, that to me is what feminism is, and that the nature of equality means that women as a group who are unequal have a political voice or a political position in which to demand equality. And that doesn't just mean, I mean, it does mean things like wage equality, but to me, it means something much grander in the very nature of the economy it is patriarchal in that it works to women's disadvantage to have children, for example. Right? Um, because there's a wage discrepancy between men and women, it makes economic sense for the woman to sacrifice her career for family. I mean, it's just literally like, well, OK, if you do it, mister, um, we're going to literally leave fifteen to twenty thousand dollars on the table a year. Why would you do that? Um, so how do I approach this as a father? Um, I'll say just a game. This stuff runs deep. And so when I was expecting, when we were expecting our, our children, we didn't know if they were going to be a boy or a girl. We didn't want to know. I wanted it to be a surprise. And I would be lying in bed at night and I'd be thinking, you know, oh, I'm going to have kids for the first time and, you know, I can do this and that. And one day it, it dawned on me that when I thought about having a boy, I instantly thought, I'm going to teach him how to play the drums. And when I thought about a girl, I thought of all these great things I do. And then I realized it never crossed my mind that I teach her to play the drums. It's like, man, this, this gendered stuff runs deep. And it's not because if you ask me, can, you know, should girls play the drum? Of course, right? But it just, it never dawned on me. That's not what popped into my mind when I thought about what I would do with my daughter. Um, so this is really deeply ingrained stuff. And so one of the things I try to do, we try to do, my, my partner Amber and I, is we try to say, well, simple things. You know, our kids are four and seven. Right? I can't really go into a discussion of patriarchy in the economy. But things like there, are, there really aren't girls and boys toys. Um, trying to you know get away just from that early onset of things being gendered it's really tough um, because if, if they're not hearing it from you they're going to hear it at school you're going to hear it from other people they can see it on tv um things which are true is that my wife is better at some things which traditionally are deemed masculine than i am um, and i try to play that up right um, well, look, mummy can do that. Mummy figured out how that goes together, how to fix that, whatever that's broken, and daddy couldn't. Um, little things like that to me are really important. And the simple fact that, you know, I just have friends that are women. Not meaning acquaintances, like some of my best friends are women. And I want my boys to see that that is how men and women can interact. It's not always about attraction. It's not that there's a man, men go do this and then they, you know, meet up with their couples. Um, that speaks to me about equality. It speaks to me in the heart of feminism as, as best as I can do it. Jessica, you really set me up on <laughs> And last but not least, what is your favorite margarita and how do you make it? <laughs> this is Riddell. <laughs> Favorite margarita. Okay, two shots of Corzo, which is really expensive tequila, but I buy it when I'm ever in the States. Uh, a shot of Cointreau, a shot of um, fresh squeezed lime, not lime cordial, no bar mix, it's gotta be a lime. Uh, and then either a little bit of simple syrup or a little bit of agave syrup. Let that on ice for a bit. Put your car keys away. <laughs> yeah, but that is my favorite margarita. Um, I'm now a complete margarita snob, and I go to a restaurant, and I have to, I'm, I'm become, I've become that guy who needs to hear the whole recipe, and nine times out of ten, it's like, no. Um, but 
if you like a good margarita, after you're done studying, kiddies, <laughs> mix one up and enjoy. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and speaking with us today. It's fantastic to uh, to have you here and on the uh, on the BU Talks podcast series. Thanks so much for having me. I, I hope I wasn't too boring or long winded, but uh, yeah. <laughs> To me, to, I mean, as a sociology student, I'm yes, it's all fantastic. <laughs> it all makes sense. But uh, yeah, I think we made it as accessible as possible to the general public. Awesome. So. Thanks for having me. <laughs>